All right, so I have adjusted my title and put in God's gender in there because that's kind of implicit in my abstract. So um, let me go ahead and start. I'm having a hard time moving my screen forward, which seemed to be, there it is, okay. So the fifth meeting of the Ecumenical Association of the Third World Theologians, also known as ETWAT, took place in New Delhi in August of 1981. The conference theme was Eruption of the Third World, Challenge to Theology. An edited book by the same name was published two years later. The central claim of ETWAT 5 uh, was that their choice to privilege the praxis of the poor as an interpretive and theological starting point erupts with an I, the, the protected border around theology, problematizing middle-class Euro-American domination of theological discourse and theology's accommodation to capitalism's political and economic practices. Etwat V's eruption occurred as neoliberalism's silent economic and cultural invasion was gaining global momentum. As the conference was taking place, Indonesian theologian Mirian Kutopo spotlighted women's marginalization from the theological enterprise with an outburst, urging her fellow participants to, quote, watch our language about God and before God. Ghanaian theologian Mercy Odioye, who was present at the meeting, later reflected on Kotopo's act in an essay for the retrospective book, characterizing Kotopo's act as the eruption within the eruption. Odioye writes, issues of sexism are supposed to belong to a minority of disgruntled, leisure-saturated middle-class women of the capitalist West. The fact is that sexism is part of the intricate web of oppression in which most of us live. Odioye's language connects gender oppression with economic oppression and could be considered a precursor to the term intersectionality. Odioye was critical of the way Christianity and Islam patriarchalized African theologies, but also recognized that African culture is implicated within imperialism in the intricate web of oppression. Marcella althaus reed arguing from an Argentinian perspective, expands Odioye's observation discerning a heteropatriarchal alliance between, quote, disparaged forms of patriarchal culture and imperial forces. At the heart of this heteropatriarchal alliance is imperial economics, gender, culture, theology, and God language. <clears throat> Odioye's reflection on Potopo's speech act suggests that the use of masculine language for God can serve as a kind of barometer that measures the strength of heteropatriarchal hegemony in a public space. In other words, God language is an indicator, perhaps, of the web of oppression. A recent article by Senior United Bible Society's consultant Alo Mujola indicates that God language in African language Bibles has become increasingly ideologically pro-masculine in recent years. Mojola recounts this shift in four East African Bible translation projects. Translators use different translation strategies to move their audiences toward masculine conceptions of God, it, to, to the extent of even uh, coining new terms. Mojola writes, even though the Bible is repeat, replete with feminine metaphors or figures for the divine, Yet an impression is given by translators and exegetes that God is masculine or in the image of a male human being. Mojola is describing pro-patriarchal activist translation of the Bible carried out by church leaders and theologians in East African contexts. At the same time, American church leaders are promoting the hetero side of heteropatriarchy in African legal discourse. 40 years ago, Kotoko Orioye and the women of Ichwat perceived a link between neoliberal economic oppression, heteropatriarchy, and God language. The contribution of this paper is to draw a line of connection between God language and Bible translation. Bible translation's complicity in the imperial heteropatriarchal alliance marks it as a key locus to engage as liberation theologian seeks to expose the alliance between heteropatriarchy and economic extraction. 
releasing people to dream life-giving alternatives into existence. So where do circles of concerned women, men, and non-binary people go from here? This paper is supporting arguments made by scholars such as Elsa Tamez and Musa Dube, who refuse to let go of Bible translation despite the Bible translation's industry's entanglement with heteropatriarchal and imperial economic forces. In addition to advancing third world feminist biblical scholarship in the academy, in Bible translation, in seminaries and churches, I suggest applying the method of contextual Bible study to translation using contextual Bible study or CBS as a process of retranslating biblical texts for grassroots liberation. My use of the word grassroots draws on the language of Kwame Bediako and his work in African translation theology. CBS has already made a space for itself as an interpretive tool in the academy in Africa and around the world by putting CBS in dialogue with translation studies, African translation hermeneutics, um, CBS at retranslation invites an eruption driven by the praxis of marginalized groups in the very communities where biblical texts, what were Bible translation is taking place. When marginalized groups retranslate biblical texts, reinterpret biblical texts for liberation in the presence of Bible translators and church leaders, an eruption occurs in the protected space of who is a translator, who is a translation reviewer, who controls the translation process. Marginalized groups of women are the largest audiences for most Bible translation projects. They need to be present in their numbers with their agendas of praxis leading the way when translation processes are occurring. Althaus Reed argues that women's lived realities, including the lived realities of their indecent sexualities, must be the starting point for doing the that is liberating. In 2016, Haddad uh, Beverly, Haddad and Gerald West published Boaz a Sugar Daddy, rereading Ruth in the context of HIV. The paper and accompanying contextual Bible studies suggests that young women look at the relationship of Boaz and Ruth from their own lived realities of economic and sexual vulnerability. In Northern Ghana, the Komba Bible translation team, which I was a part, uh, adapted the Sugar Daddy CDS and engaged young women in school and young women in seamstresses apprenticeships in the interpretation and translation process. We discovered that women noticed details in the translated story of Ruth, details that imply the relationship between Boaz and Ruth was economic and sexual before it was sacred. The sanitized and sacred barrier around Boaz and Ruth's relationship are transgressed by asking young women the question, is this a sugar daddy relationship? As young women and men enter the process of translating, interpreting the language of the story of Ruth, the language is shown to be complex veiled language that has a double meaning. As young women and men retranslate the story and characters begin to co-inhabit their world. And in time, they can practice wielding the language of the biblical story, building a language of solidarity across difference that critiques the web of oppression as different sectors experience it. But there is a long way to go before marginalized sectors develop a language of solidarity, using the language of the Bible to critique heteropatriarchy and economics, especially in our current neoliberal context. What can be done to further CBS as retranslation, preparing the way for what we hope will one day be a social eruption with an E, a day when marginalized roots who have no fields and all the farmhands disenfranchised by economic patriarchy will work together to put their hands into the sheaves. Thanks. And firstly, let me go to Nathan. And the first thing that came into my mind that flickered my mind, my thought is like, oh, how wonderful it is. Because in the history of um, feminist theology, we have the Bible, women, Bible, and when we women work for ourselves, the other, our counterpart, the men folk, many of them doesn't like us 
So when men are working the job of women for the promotion of the women and for the liberation of women, um, that is highly appreciated and people smile also are getting in touch with them more giving attention to their work also for that. I really would like to say thanks to Nathan also. And secondly, like um, Bible translation is one of the area which I'm also getting interest so much. And the college where, where I'm working through Mpoo College is also giving a, a study course to diploma in Bible translation, but still in Bible translation. And now master course is not yet um, open, but soon it will be open. So this is the area which I also um, have interest and I might like to go for that. And translation of the Bible is very important because it is the heart and the core of the Christianity which can, uh, to which we can bring the word of God to each and every people. And at the same time, I also have uh, one uh, kind of, uh, not, uh, not very negative, but in my life, I have been through that people who are having so many um, smaller clan and uh, people who are having their own dialect, but within one umbrella of ethnic or tribe or clan. When the Bible has been translated and it is given to them, it creates social differences and social disparity. And I suppose like, um, I will give uh, one example to my own community. In my, uh, my community, under the un one name of a tribe, there are so many minor tribes. And these minor tribes, uh, let me put it as a finger. This is our hand and we are having five fingers. And so all these um, fingers also belongs to the hand. But when the Bible translation has been given to each and every dialect, the social unity that exists has been divided. When people started reading Bible in their own dialect, they loved to be uh, st uh, to stick with the dialect and they long to worship God in their own language. And so in the, in the social reality, it creates some kind of division and differences. This is one thing which I see and some, uh, well, there, there was a point of time when I think that, oh, this Bible translation and giving in each and every tribe their own, their own Bible, is it good or not? Because, because it creates some problem in the society. That, 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 the thing that uh, which I found in my life, so I'm just sharing for our future thoughts, maybe. And that is that. And so now uh, another issue which I have, uh, I found in the Bible translation and the use of God language and in translating into women language. If we transform or translate all the God language into women language, I think we will fail. We will be ending to the same situation uh, like mm, the Bible God talk will be too feminine, purely feminine. That kind of thing can be there. So uh, in my mind, I think like if we put the transcendence of God and if we translate the God language into more inclusive term, like not just men or women or not just um, male pronoun or uh, female pronoun. So, but the inclusivity is the thing which we, we need to give importance. If not like, uh, even though we are talking about liberation, some sections of the people are in need of liberation. But if we are really liberated, will there be the same kind of oppression? Will the same kind of oppression, the same kind of discrimination will come when the subject of liberation are coming up at the level to oppress other? That is my question in the radical theology when we deal with liberation theology in a very radical way. Uh, I'm just sharing my concern.